On my 20th birthday, I stood on the corner of an alleyway on the Rue de Commerce in Paris. My all-time favorite artist, Sheila Hicks, had accepted to meet for an informal discussion of her work. Unreasonably intimidated, nervous, and filled with excitement, I was speechless at how, instead of walking me directly to her studio, she was taking me to her local bookstore. The bookstore owner was keen on the artist's work, and she had positioned her book right by the window showcase. The artist, Sheila, she was really reluctant to talk about herself, and she insisted that I read this book if I wanted to know more about herself, her life, and her journey. We sat in a boulangerie and we discussed and compared our travels. She had been to Cambodian weaving towns, and so had I, and she felt saddened for the exploitation of the textile industry in China. So did I. We talked about my upcoming trip to India and her own personal experience in that country, and also previously in Latin America. We visited several exhibitions, and we slowly made our way to her studio, which was located inside a mind-blowing alleyway that led to an inner courtyard where I couldn't hold myself from taking this photograph as I realized I was standing right where her piece, Target, had been photographed. Inside her studio, Sheila stressed the importance of sensing the artwork rather than questioning it. And she set me free to understand the idea that art was a unity of sensations come to work. While listening to her speak, I began to sense a deeper understanding of not only her practice, but of her inspirations. And I began to see art as the channel to not only understand an artist, but a person's whole life journey. As I translated this knowledge, my own personal passion for materiality, social relations, and travel became worthy and relevant areas of investigation. Her warm-heartedness, her wisdom, and her disinterested advice were the guiding light for me to embark on a personal tr trip understanding the meaning of my practice. So before I go any further, I would like to take a moment to appreciate the value of this encounter. Being an artist is something that comes deep from my heart, but if I'm honest, it is just a small part of who I am. There are so many other areas of life that I enjoy that if I had to separate who I am and my practice, my art would definitely feel empty. This has made me feel very insecure at times, like what I'm doing is not really art, or that I can never be able to focus at one thing at a time. But what can I do if my ideas only spark at this personal, unexpected, and creative crossroads? I don't want to sound as someone who's too in love with the idea of what they're doing right now. I am young, and I'm aware that my ideas on life change radically from year to year. I thought I would like to talk in a way that I, I would be able to look at my young self in time and still feel moved. Like most of us here today, I also feel lost when I visit an exhibition of contemporary art. And even though I practice this craft daily, it is really hard for me to understand what's happening inside my colleagues' minds. When I visit shows with family or friends, it is likely that we exit with a look in our face that suggests, I had no idea what was going on in there. As much as I try to, or as much as I would like to, I, I cannot understand contemporary art. It's weird, I cannot relate to it. And I agree, I wish art were more approachable, less autonomous, and less separate from its surrounding. This is why I like to place so much importance in the story behind things, in the experience, in the people involved in the journey of making, and in what we actually go through as human beings while creating our masterpiece. How can we expect someone inside a gallery to fully relate to a work of art when they have no idea of what was going on in the artist's life and in his surrounding at that time. So I guess my question today is, how can art become a more humane experience for people? I could start my journey today by talking about Spain, where I come from, 
or talking about the UK where I first moved to when I left home. But I believe my true artistic self began to expand and develop when I moved to Beijing. In such a consumer society as China, buyers are not only interested in obtaining new products, but also in discarding the old. Technological developments have made quantity and quality become serious problems. And it is therefore why my practice became an ongoing performance, searching and collecting everyday discarded materials. I question what was bound to happen when a foreigner is exposed to an unknown object and how he or she would adopt it in contrast to someone who uses it daily. For example, I used to broom my floor using these brooms made of dried flowers and dried corn, and to be honest, they didn't really do a very good job. So I decided to transcend them into art. A similar thing happened with this installation, which is made of no more than putting mobs together. These mobs are made of beautiful strips of colorful clothes, but again, they don't really clean people's floor. So I decided to transcend them into art again. Doing this was allowing me to look through materials as a way to understand my own personal experience of being in China. And while having to look for these supplies, I was having to go to the city's most uninviting material markets, where I was both breathtaking at the variety of stuff, but also furious at its unwelcoming vendors. I had to carry my supplies in the back of a motorcycle that was driving on the opposite direction of traffic. And of course, on the way home, we had to stop to say hi to the driver's cousin, <laughs> who had a shop where I eventually met another guy who wanted to take me to the city's cheapest bamboo store. When I was there, I met the shopkeeper and his entire family, who happened to live at the back of the shop. We spent the evening drinking tea and hanging out in their backyard, and I got convinced to buy some of their bamboo. I was also given some leftover hay, and that story translated into this installation. This is what I mean. How can we expect anyone else to know? And we forget that these are precisely the stories that move people and that really makes art relatable. When I came back to the UK, I started collaborating with a hairdressing salon, a place I totally didn't belong to. We collected customer hair for over a month and we wrote down the customer's names and their nationality. There wasn't much reasoning for me doing this. It was just a new way of feeling inspired by doing things that I wouldn't usually do. However, doing this made me curious of what would happen if I start stitching hair onto fabrics, which made me interested in how are fabrics actually made, which eventually opened up the doors for me to get funded to travel to India. I not only wanted to learn about the weaving process itself, I wanted to learn weaving in terms of the experience of the person who weaves that fabric. So only in a weaving workshop, in the materials country of origin, would I really be able to understand the root of textiles. While being in India, I spent almost two months living with local weavers in the jungle. And it was once again through this deep self-immersion that I began to focus on the intensity and on the transformative effect of the experience, rather than on the art object itself. I also realized how much possession I claimed over my work, and also how hard it was for local people to relate to what I was doing. These people couldn't care less if their name remained unknown, and I must say that without their help, my work would have failed terribly. After weeks of living there, I really became part of this family. And so when I look at my work, I not only see a well-crafted and beautiful tapestry, I see a vulnerable object with human qualities and stories to share. It has my accomplishments, my struggles, and also 
every moment that I shared with this community, it's embedded on it. And so it marks a key moment in my life, and hopefully also in theirs. When I came back to London, I felt very uninspired by the art world. I couldn't deal with the idea of living in a comfortable city, making art in a comfortable studio, being surrounded by students who lived comfortable lives. It felt really dishonest. And also, listening to people speak about my work was deeply painful. <laughs> they thought this tapestry had been made in London, in a conventional art studio, by someone who happened to enjoy weaving and fiber art. They had no idea of what I had gone through in order to make this. And so I started to feel a really big distance between my art and my life. It is then when I realized that most of us today, we like to separate who we are on a personal level and who we are on our field. And I realized this really doesn't work for me. If I want to be creative, I first of all have to be inspired by the way I live and by what kind of impact I want to have on the world. I also realized that the way I was making was really incompatible with this obsession of constant production of objects. And so I became more interested in the production of experiences. It all started when I moved into these houseboats with a crazy Cuban chef that I had never met before. From that moment, I lost every sense of self. We went from him sleeping in the sofa, I was sleeping on the bed, we were sharing a wardrobe, we were sharing clothes. I could hear him snore every night. Mm -hmm. He could hear my farts <laughs> if I farted. <laughs> and really, I started to question where is home? And it became my motto for the past year. And since then, I've lived in over 35 different habitats. In April, I went to Joshua Tree to live in the desert in these wagon stations that the artist Andrea Sitel has set up, together with 12 other writers, thinkers, musicians, artists, we questioned how everyday actions could be transformed into art. Together we explored every aspect of how we lived, from how we slept, how we ate, how we socialized with each other. And for the first time in my life, everything was art. As you can imagine, this trip really changed me. And when I was so excited that on my return, I convinced my classmate to transform this IKEA banquet into our home for the next two months. This was in Kingston, by the way. <laughs> we slept there for almost two months, every day. We cooked for others, and we received so many donations. So for the first time in my life, the question of the, whether this was art with a capital A or not stopped worrying me. Because during this time, I met more people than in my entire three years of BA. And I witnessed how powerful and positive things can be when we work together as people. These lifestyles really, really changed me. And they've had a really big impact in my life and who I am today, and who I want to be. And oh, yeah, these are the donations we were receiving for the market people in Kingston, and also all the people that we were meeting <laughs> during the time. And then when we were kicked out, um, we donated the bed to a little boy in Brighton called George, and I took off again. This time, I went to teach art to Tamil refugees in India. After we finished the project, I went to live in the world's largest experimental city, which I recommend everyone to go. I wish I had more time to talk about all of these experiences as well, but what I'm really trying to get across today is how important it is to fight for an art that is humane, down to earth, and approachable. Our creative drive should be the highest medium for personal motivation self-discovery, and change in the world. It should make us listen clearer, open our eyes, expand our minds, and push our hearts to love in a different way. 
Only then will we be able to sit in a gallery of contemporary art and still feel moved. Thank you.